Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Dean Takahashi. I'm the lead writer for GamesBeat at VentureBeat. Um, and yeah, congratulations to Mike on this award that he's going to be receiving here. Um, and it's an honor for me uh, to be here on this stage as well, uh, in the stage of your career, uh, because uh, you know, I was I was there for the the beginning, um, writing one of the first stories on what was then Chaos Studios uh, about 27 years ago, uh, when I was at the uh, Los Angeles Times, and uh, uh, yeah, that eventually became Blizzard, and uh, uh, you left in uh, October of uh, 2018. I just wondered what have you been doing uh, in the last uh, months. So, uh, you know, it was a, a pretty big uh, uh, decision and, and change in my life because I've been with Blizzard for 20, almost 28 years mm -hmm. when I stepped down in October. Um, I've been spending a lot more time with, with my family, um, mm -hmm. who uh, my wife and daughter are here. Um, mm -hmm. My daughter is four, so this is her first games conference, I think. <laughs> um, We've been uh, spending time traveling and uh, really thinking about what to do next. Um, my wife and I worked together at Blizzard, so we both left around the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think uh, it's ni really nice to take a break. It's uh, a lot of hard work, you know. Uh, we were <clears throat> very focused. Um, I think uh, focus is so important when you're um, when you're making games, and I was very, very focused on the company and the games that we were making for, for such a long time that um, it's quite a change to sort of step back and be able to look at all the amazing things happening in the world um, and uh, kind of have a blank sheet of paper and think about all the, all the different possibilities about what, what we might do in the future. So you're thinking about doing something new? Definitely thinking about mm -hmm. doing something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, everything uh, will be new. Yeah. So what? What does this sort of give us a small flavor of what it was like in the beginning? I guess so. Uh, when you uh, you met Alan Adam and uh, and Frank Pierce and got, got the uh, the company going. So um, so it goes back to when I was at UCLA. Uh, I was studying electrical engineering, um, and actually became very good friends uh, with with this other. Uh, student, Alan Adham, and Alan was studying um, computer science and engineering. <clears throat> Actually, how we became friends is an interesting story. Mm -hmm. um, we had a couple of classes together during my last year, and uh, one day we were sitting in the computer lab. It was just the two of us working uh, on our project, and Alan had, uh, he had to print something, and back then the printer was located on another floor in the building, so he locked his terminal, went to retrieve the document that he printed, and so now it's just me sitting alone with this uh, locked computer terminal next to me, and um, I noticed that after 10 minutes it unlocked. So now I'm sitting alone with a computer that was locked, and now it's no longer locked. <laughs> so I did what probably all of you would have done, is I relocked it, typed in a different password, my own password. I wanted to pick something that I wouldn't forget because I figured I'd have to reveal it. I wanted to pick something I'd never used before. So I picked Joe, J-O-E, lowercase. Sat down at my computer and Alan comes back five minutes later, sits down and um, he t when he types in his password, it unlocks. <laughs> so I'm like, what happened? <laughs> so I'm like, Alan, how did you do that? He said, do what? I just typed in my password. I said, what was your password? He said, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> I said, was it Joe? <laughs> and he said, how did you know? <laughs> anyway, we, we uh, laughed for like a half an hour. We just couldn't believe that that had happened mm -hmm. and became very good friends. And when Alan graduated uh, uh, UCLA, he wanted to start up a gaming company. And um, he said about recruiting me to join him. Um, I actually graduated six months after Alan. I had gotten a job with Western Digital um, uh, writing test software for their, net, for their network cards. Mm -hmm. I had no game development experience. Um, and Alan uh, basically 
he told me, look, Mike, it's not rocket science. If we get some of our smart friends together, we can figure out how to do anything. Um, we, we'll just... Um, we'll just find people that are passionate about making games that are really smart and um, we'll be able to compete with the best companies out there. <laughs> um, it's funny, so um, I said, well, you know, let me, uh, why don't you come over? I want my dad to hear what you have to say. Um, Alan actually, you know, gave the whole pitch um, and my dad said, you know, Mike, you've got a great job at Western Digital. Um, this sounds very risky. Um, and uh, I also seeked other advice. One of my cousins um, said something different. He said, Mike, you're young. You don't have a family yet. If it doesn't work out, you can always get another job. And, uh, and so I ended up quitting the job at Western Digital and, and joining Alan, and we started Silicon and Synapse. Alan had been friends with Frank Pierce from school. They had some classes together and um, they would always go after class to the arcade and play, uh, play arcade games. And so when we, f we started, it was the three of us, Alan, Frank, and I. Mm -hmm. You met Frank on the first day of... I did, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Our first day at work was, um, we had stopped at, uh, at a local office supply store, bought a couple of uh, as assemble your own desks sort of desks, and we spent the first day building desks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so there was like, like a defining moment uh, early on in, in Blizzard's history around the Lost Vikings, I guess, right? And um, you had this experience with Brian Fargo uh, very early where he gave you guys feedback on the work you had done on the Lost Vikings. And you want to tell us a bit about that story? Yeah, so um, Lost Vikings was kind of our first completely original game. And uh, let's see, it was for the Super Nintendo, which um, was actually hadn't, let's see, I think it had just come out that year. Um, and so we wanted to basically release this game. Uh, no, actually, no, it had, already, it had come out a couple of years before. But, and we had done a couple of other games, but this was the first completely original product that we were making. Um, Interplay Productions, Brian Fargo's company was going to be publishing it. So we're, they were funding development. And, um, we had gotten to a stage where we were pretty happy with the game. The development team, uh, we thought we were pretty close to finishing um, the game and Brian Fargo had taken the game home to play. And when he came back with his feedback, um, it was actually very critical and very harsh. He thought the game was too difficult. He thought that our characters all looked too similar. He wanted us to redo some of the major artwork for the game and I think, um, this was a very um, important learning point because my initial instinct was, he doesn't, what does he know? He doesn't know what he's talking about. The game's fine. We should just release it. We're almost done. Alan's uh, reaction was the opposite. Alan felt like, actually, Brian's right about everything. We should go and make all of these changes. Um, and uh, we actually didn't have the art resources to do all of the art changes that um, Brian wanted us to do. And so our, uh, Brian actually supplied us with one of the Interplay artists who spent a bunch of time redoing the art. And go after going through all of this process and seeing how much better the game became because of the improved art for the main characters, because of the levels becoming much more... Um, uh, much more intuitive, um, much less frustrating for new players. I mean, I really got to see the importance of fresh perspective mm -hmm. and um, the danger that um, when you're so immersed in a product and you're working on it with a group of people that's also working on the same thing, it's very easy to lose sight of um, the flaws in your product because you know why you made every single decision and you know how the game is supposed to be played. How, and um, you have to see how untainted um, players interact with the product who weren't in all the design meetings, who don't know how to control the characters, who don't know the right way to avoid the obstacles and dangers, um, 
And so constantly getting fresh perspective to look at, at the product and, and react to it is, uh, is critical. Mm -hmm. And so that we built that into the process. So this became like the ethos for, for Blizzard to focus on uh, getting it right, quality? Uh, yeah, uh, quality, definitely um, quality, uh, easy to learn. Mm -hmm. So having depth, but still having accessibility to make, make sure it's easy to learn, difficult to master. Um, and making sure that the, uh, the folks who are designing the game or pr and programming the game aren't judging mm -hmm. the difficulty. So the funny thing is that you, you probably should not get an award for just focusing on quality because it's an obvious thing to do. It right? is. Yeah. It's like everybody knows That's right. that they should do that. Like, but uh, it's interesting how everybody knows that, but mm, so few people actually really do it in a meaningful way. I, I think everybody sets out to do it. Uh -huh. And then you run into um, the realities of the world and the pressures of the world and the, um, the desire to, um, to achieve whatever the plan is, to um, make whatever, whoever the stakeholders are, make sure that they're happy. And it may be um, budgetary issues, it may be... Um, timeliness issues, it, it may be um, people getting too attached to ideas that are there and not wanting to change them. Um, so I think all of these things, there's a balance, you know, obviously uh, there's a saying that perfect is the enemy of great um, because if you strive for perfection, um, you will maybe never ship. So there's a good point that's good enough, but um, but I do think that um, there's so much competition out there that if you don't hit a quality bar, then the product will just fail. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you mentioned that your ship rate may have been something like 50%, like 50% of the games you guys started actually shipped. Yeah, and I've sort of gone back every, every few years and kind of checked the math on that, and we've been pretty consistent. It's about half of the titles that we start don't ever, um, don't ever make it. Of course, you never start out thinking that something you start isn't going to make it, but at some point along the way, you realize for, for one reason or another, and it may be you don't think the market is there. It may be you don't think that the product will ever, maybe the opportunity cost of getting the product to where it needs to be mm -hmm. is just too high. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, uh, you gave a talk some years ago at the Dice Summit where you, I think you said 14 games had been killed. Uh, in Blizzard's history, right? I'm sure it's <laughs> Games gone that had up their from titles there. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's a, that's a lot of uh, sort of following through on this, uh, this quality mission, I guess. Yeah, and so I think the thing that we, we really were committed to doing is that um, if we do decide to ship something, mm -hmm. then it needs to, um, we need to be comfortable putting the Blizzard name on, on the game because I, we really viewed the Blizzard um, brand as our most important asset. I mean, obviously the people are extremely important, but um, in terms of our most important product maybe, um, the Blizzard brand, we wanted it to stand for something. We wanted to build trust uh, in that brand. Um, early on, we used to have this dream where um, you know, a gamer walks into a store and gamers aren't really walking to stores anymore, but imagine a gamer walks into a store and sees a few products on the shelf, a few boxes, one of them is by Blizzard, but they've never, they don't know anything about the game. And then some other ones, maybe they know a little bit more about. We wanted them to choose the Blizzard one just based off of the brand alone, knowing that if Blizzard's name is on the box, they know it will be great. Mm -hmm. And that was a very motivating idea for us. Mm -hmm. So uh, you learn uh, some things from these games uh, that, uh, that either slipped or actually never shipped. I mean, like what, what do you think some of those lessons are? Well, maybe um, let's talk first about one that did ship, mm -hmm. um, Diablo. Um, Diablo, it was, this was back in uh, 1996. So um, this is a box product. Um, 
And uh, in the United States, the absolute most important retail weekend at the time was Thanksgiving. Um, because the Christmas holiday season is, was just huge and um, the biggest retail weekend of the year is Thanksgiving and so conventional wisdom was you have to get the game out in November before Thanksgiving. And um, Diablo was not gonna be ready and we tried everything, we had everybody, in fact we took down the entire StarCraft development team to try to help pile on, to help get Diablo out and um, we had some multiplayer um, bugs that just um, basically prevented the game from being in a shippable state. And we continued working and then it became uh, evident that we were in danger of missing the year entirely. We worked as hard as we could. We actually missed Christmas. Um, I think that we finally uh, mastered the product on December 30th and they started shipping boxes December 31st. So I like to say we made the year. Kind of. Um, but the um, moral of the story was that um, it was the best selling game in 1997. Mm -hmm. And nobody really remembers or cares that we missed Christmas or that we missed Thanksgiving. The fact is that that was a great game and people remember playing it and people remember loving it. And the lesson that we took from that is it's way more important that the game is great. Um, and it is way less important that you hit the date that you, that you wanna make, even though it's extremely painful and it's, it's extremely painful every time, but what would have been way worse if we had put out a buggy product um, November 15th and then maybe the game would have been a failure and I wouldn't be even sitting here. Mm -hmm. And do you have some more lessons too, like uh, some others that uh, apply for, from other games? Let's see. <clears throat> I'm sure there are. <laughs> um, so, uh, while we were, while, well, okay, I'll t I guess I'll take um, maybe Titan as, as one. So, uh, Project Titan is a game, we try, we've tried really hard not to announce any games that weren't ready to be announced, where we weren't sure that we were gonna be releasing them. Titan is an exception to that, where this game um, was, uh, uh, we wanted it to be our next generation, our sequel to sort of World of Warcraft. We took a lot of our senior developers and put, put them on this project. Um, and I think where we, where we really failed was we failed to control scope. Um, it was very ambitious. Um, it was we were, a science fiction version of World of Warcraft, I guess. It M wasn't, or? it was a brand new universe mm -hmm. and um, it was, um, going to, was going to be the next generation MMO that did all sorts of things and it had different modes and we were kind of made, building two games in parallel Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, and um, they sort of never really came together, and we struggled, and the game was in development for many years, and we, um, we were, we had sort of, kind of, we didn't announce the game, but we had talked about that we were working on a next gen generation MMO. I think that the, somehow the code name uh, did get out there. I don't know if we released that or not, but next generation MMO. I remember it in a bunch of <laughs> uh, slides, mostly targeted at um, sort of analysts and investors because um, we were part of a public company. But um, when we did finally, uh, so what ended up happening with that game is at some point the team uh, basically came to us and said that um, the engine really wasn't where it needed to be and the team had grown to a point that it was really difficult to get the engine to where it needed to be while keeping all keeping the team busy and so they wanted to uh, basically take some time to redo all the tooling and the uh, technology to be able to be more productive making the game and instead of doing that we asked the team to take a couple of months and think about, that's one idea that we could do going forward. Think about a couple of other ideas where if we were to start right now and do anything we wanted, 
what other things could we do? And they took about two months, came up with a couple of different ideas, and one of those ideas was Overwatch. <clears throat> and um, the team was very excited about that idea, and we ultimately, you know, of course, decided to move forward and make Overwatch. But I think that th that's... Um, you, had uh, to, you had to make a decision there? We did like, have to make a decision, uh, yeah. And like what was Overwatch as far as like how it was described to you at that point? Like uh, it didn't really exist, right? It didn't, well the, the pitch was basically um, it was going to be a, uh, an evolution of like a Team Fortress sort of mm -hmm. game mm -hmm. in a uh, superhero universe. You know, and it was gonna leverage mm -hmm. some technology that was um, Basically, we're gonna take uh, some of our best technology from Titan and from World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. um, we were gonna take some uh, characters and worlds from some of the Titan universe mm -hmm. uh, uh, design. And, um, and we thought we could make a really, really compelling game, which much, much t with much tighter uh, scope control. Um, And I think, you know, probably one of the best decisions that we made, mm -hmm. right? We took something that um, wasn't going to ship for a long time and may never have shipped mm -hmm. and turned it into something that was a, an awesome universe and an awesome game. What's and, and now it's one of, mm -hmm. one of Blizzard's strongest teams, too. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting to me, and in in like in all of that that you described, you were not the first you know, like Blizzard was not the first to create Team Fortress, right? <laughs> and you were not the first to create a lot of the games uh, where you entered these genres. Um, you know, you, you didn't do the first real-time strategy game, right? Mm -mm. Uh, so very interesting that um, a Blizzard was in some ways following others into genres, right? I think we, uh, we, we definitely, we always tried to look for um, areas of the market that we felt like we could add something to. So um, where there's a, a game that we love, uh, a game that um, we feel like if we took, that we could take it somewhere that it hasn't, hasn't gone before, we might be able to take elements from different genres to create something that's brand new. Mm -hmm. So I want to switch a little bit to uh, like the scope of these 27 years or so, 28 years, um, like Blizzard uh, changed hands many times. And um, when I came in and wrote this first story, it was about um, you know these these two three guys uh, who in their 20s were now rich because they had sold their video game company uh, to Davidson uh, for seven and a half million bucks. Six point seven six, six, five. Six. So uh, that, you know, you guys in your 20s uh, could have retired on that money, right? And then yeah, I don't know in that effect, it would have you, lasted you waited 27 long. years to retire instead. And, um, so, uh, and then the, uh, the company went from Davidson to CUC to Sendent to Havas to Vivendi to Activision, ultimately Activision Blizzard. Uh, and I think well, that, to Activision Blizzard, right, never right, to right, Activision. Right. But the last transaction was twenty-two billion dollars or twenty billion dollars. Yeah, it was like about that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty-two. Yeah. So uh, it's probably a good thing that you stayed. Yeah, right? I've I've read on the, on the <laughs> internet that somehow people like take the twenty-two billion dollar transaction and somehow assign me a percentage of that, mm -hmm. which is uh, very incorrect, because <laughs> we sold the company a long time ago for uh -huh. six point seven five million. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully you got a bonus out of that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, but why did you stay then? Like, uh, I think even Alan, you know, uh, checked out early at what ten years or so. And uh, Alan, um, mm -hmm. Alan actually uh, uh, left right before World of Warcraft shipped. Mm -hmm. So he was the original uh, lead designer on the game, but he uh, he did leave before before we shipped it. Mm -hmm. um, he went off and. Uh, created a hedge fund, mm -hmm. and uh, he managed that for like a decade. And then I think he missed gaming too much. He called me up one day and said, hey, Mike, you know, 
I would really, uh, really want to get back into gaming. I said, we would love to have you back. And so he's actually back at Blizzard now, mm -hmm. yeah. working on new products. Yeah, that's neat. Um, when, when he left, did you feel comfortable taking over all, all of the leadership at that point? Well, so um, right after we shipped StarCraft, um, Alan actually stepped down as president, mm -hmm. and, um, and that's when I took over as president. Um, so that was, that was sort of the moment that I, that I was running Blizzard. Um, when, um, when Alan left, uh, sort of when he left completely, um, he was part of our management team, but um, that was less of a, a transition for me personally. I mean, for the World of Warcraft team, it was pretty huge. Mm -hmm. So you, you, uh, you started with him leading this way into sort of doing the right thing, I guess. Yeah. And uh, um, Blizzard still continued to do the right thing over the years, right? Like, how, how did... How did well, I remember, one, uh, I remember one other uh, moment. Mm -hmm. It was right after we shipped StarCraft. And um, I mean, nowadays, when Blizzard releases a game, it's localized into all of these different languages, and we do a global sim ship. But back um, in 98, when we released StarCraft, it was launched in English. And then over the course of the next year or two, we, end, we translated it into a lot of other languages. And so one of the first languages that we were working on was German. And I remember um, our, uh, the partner that we were working with had secured some major German magazine cover for us. Um, and we were gonna be able to put our discs with the magazine, it was this big opportunity. But we had to deliver the um, the German master like that day or something. And um, I had a list of bugs that we were working on fixing and it was sort of this dilemma. Do we ship it with, with some of these bugs? And some of them were like um, language typos, you know, German, German language things that just weren't, it was like a polish issue. Um, and so I basically took the problem to Alan and I said, hey, Alan, here's this opportunity, you know, but we need to give him the discs today, but we have these bugs, what should we do? And he um, immediately said, fix the problems. Like, there'll be other covers, don't worry about that. Like, why wouldn't you just fix these? And um, that was um, amazing for me because um, he was right. But you, it's so easy to lose sight of, of that because you have these opportunities that you're gonna miss. Um, and I think that that's something that I sort of carried with me um, for many, many years, that sort of mentality that, you know, let's, let's get it right. Let's get it as right as we can get it. And even if it means missing a few, a few opportunities, uh, other opportunities will, will always come along and just kind of having faith. Mm -hmm. So Blizzard uh, uh, is distinct from a lot of the other game companies out there in, I think, how rarely it got into such deep trouble with its fans, right? <laughs> if you look at Electronic Arts, it's almost a, a yearly occurrence uh, for them. Well, you know, we had a, our fans uh, keep us on our toes, for sure. You know, mm -hmm. people are, we have a lot of passionate players that um, that definitely, let us know when they don't agree with certain decisions. I think that um, uh, Diablo 3 was certainly, certainly a, a really tough launch for us. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a lot, of, uh, a lot of feedback about the game, about the auction house, about um, the impact of the auction house on the game. Which was, can you, can you well, describe that? That was what I was leading to. Was, yeah, uh, so... The, the option house was one of these big run-ins you had with the family. I mean, just a little background on that. So, um, one of the things we were thinking about when we were working on Diablo 3, so in Diablo 2, there was a secondary market for items. Um, and when there is a secondary market for trading, if you don't provide a or sort of official 
mechanism of doing this, you get all sorts of um, behaviors that occur in, in the game mm -hmm. that are um, damaging to the play experience of, of people. You could have people um, that are trying to steal items from, from people um, via either in-game mechanics um, or um, uh, trying to steal passwords with key loggers or various things like that. And so, um, and then you also have people that set up businesses to facilitate item, item trading and not all of them are um, above board businesses. Some of them are just trying to steal your credit cards, let's say. And so we knew that this was an issue. Mm -hmm. And so in, in approaching Diablo 3, we thought, okay, people are gonna do this anyway. Why don't we just provide them a safe and secure way of trading items? But the problem was we didn't really design the item, um, the loot model with that in mind. We designed it and play tested it without an auction house internally. And so when you add in an auction house, in a, in a game that's dropping tons and tons of loot, um, you have this situation where it's way cheaper and way easier to get secondhand items off of this auction house than it is to spend the hours and hours of playing the game and earning the items yourself because no matter how many hours you play, you're crowdsourcing sort of the second best items from the entire world and making them available very, very inexpensively. And um, it made it so that, well, as soon as you go to the auction house, you're never gonna, you're gonna have a very hard time finding any better items in the game, which completely destroys the item reward mm -hmm. loop. The, the whole game loop is So you destroyed. discovered early on what later came to be the pay to win problem, I guess? Um, yeah, but it's not even really paying very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, your second, your, your second best sword has no value to you. So you're gonna put it up in the auction house and you're gonna sell it pretty cheap because lots of people have swords that are way better than the ones that you're offering. And so when I go to buy a sword, your, swords, your second best sword is way better than my best sword. I'm gonna buy that for like a dollar. That's not really, that's sort of pay to not have fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. So you guys did ultimately did the right thing with this, right? We did. We had an op we. I felt like we, we had an op an opportunity with our, um, with our expansion, almost like this one time opportunity to relaunch the game. And so we went to the, um, we went to the game team and we basically said, hey, so, would removing the auction house make the game better? And they said yes. So if you do whatever you wanted and remove the auction house, would you snap your fingers and remove it? And they said, yes, absolutely. And we said, okay, well then that's what you should do. Mm -hmm. Did that ruin the chief financial officer's day, I guess? Or did the... um, I don't think so. I, okay. But I mean, I don't think there was a spreadsheet that, sh that you could show the chief financial officer that would prove to them that that was the right call. Mm -hmm. But it was the right call. Mm -hmm. I think all gamers know it was the right call. So you put this in, in another lesson, I guess, uh, thing, things that were lessons for you, I guess. What, what about other things that felt like the biggest decisions and also maybe the biggest uh, regrets? Um, well, one of the things that we one of the things that we realized um, with the evolution of, of gaming and um, how you know gaming is now this global thing, I think it's a lot more mass market than it ever has been, um, is that we started off um, trying to make individual games and then we realized that it's actually um, really, a lot of it is about the community around the games as much as the games themselves. And so um, really investing in and supporting that community around the games. We started running um, BlizzCon in 2005. Um, it really started as, you know, we had World of Warcraft, which was very successful. Um, we saw that um, EverQuest had a show 
uh, uh, that they had all the EverQuest folks coming out to you, and that was very successful. And we thought, well, hey, why don't we do something like that with World of Warcraft? And that thinking sort of led to, well, if we're going to do that, we really should be celebrating all the Blizzard communities, not just World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really kind of an experiment in the beginning. We had no idea whether people would want to attend or, or whatever, but um, it was so successful um, that the show has really grown from being initially like 6,000 people to the latest one, I think it was about 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of become sort of the epicenter of the Blizzard community and um, really important for our developers too, mm -hmm. to interact directly, to have that FaceTime interact directly with some of our most passionate players. Um, and it just kind of, after the show, everybody comes back to work mm -hmm. energized in a completely different way. So that most recent BlizzCon uh, was where you, you know, chose to hand over the reins to yeah. J. Allen Brack, right? And uh, that, w that was also the, um, the show where, um, you know, Blizzard also got its rare negative fan reaction as well when uh, Diablo Mobile got announced. Yes, that's I wondered true. how you looked back on, on that as well. You can kind of look at some of this, uh, you know, from outside of Blizzard. Yeah. Uh, now, yeah, right. And yeah, I mean, you know, so that's sort of like when you have a, a group that's really passionate about a franchise like Diablo and really excited about a product that hasn't been announced yet. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think Blizzard tried to manage expectations that they weren't going to announce Diablo 4 at the event, but I think that um, I'm not sure that message really got through. Um, you know, they posted on the, on the forums and everything like that. In the past, that's sort of been enough. Um, in this case, I, I think most of the audience probably did not get that memo. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it's rare for you guys to talk about games in advance anyway, right? Because so many yeah. of them actually in, got in killed. Yeah, in that right? case, yeah. maybe, um, maybe there should have been more discussion about that mm -hmm. the Diablo franchise is not abandoning the PC. But, so it's um, like the expectations for fans just sort of got out of, or allowed to get out of control, I guess. That's sort of you know, if you had announced the products in a different order, I think it'd probably be fine. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. lessons have hopefully been learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, there's, I mean, Blizzard had some interesting perspective on a lot of things over the years, like China uh, being a huge uh, developing force in gaming, and uh, you had this early, you know, relationship with the Nine, and then eventually with NetEase. Um, I'm kind of curious what your perspective on on China is uh, for the future of games. China is an absolutely huge market. You know, you have over a billion people that's playing games. Uh, um, and so I think maybe it was last year or so that China surpassed the United States as being the largest gaming market in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you've got huge, uh, a lot of investment in China in developing games. And so, I mean, it's going to be a major force in mm -hmm. gaming. Mm -hmm. And I think you're going to start probably seeing more, um, more games coming out to the Western market. So historically, it's been really the Western market importing or exporting games into China. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to start seeing more uh, stuff coming out of China mm -hmm. to the rest of the world. How about esports too? Um, like StarCraft was essentially the beginning of that, right? Yep. Yeah, StarCraft really, um, eSports started out, out of Korea, but um, eSports was popular in Asia um, to a level that's, uh, you know, the United States and, and the West is really only just catching up to in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you're looking at the future of that, like what, what are your, your expectations for Oh, I think esports is going to continue uh, continue growing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that uh, this is sort of just the beginning. I think um, you know, back in 2010, with um, with Twitch becoming very popular, it made um, broadcasting esports um, accessible to 
all sorts of different broadcasters and publishers, so you don't need to rely on um, other media. You can go direct to consumer now. Mm -hmm. And so I think that just really uh, ignited something that's just not going to slow down or stop. Mm -hmm. So we've got that uh, brewing. We also have uh, Google Stadia and um, Yves Guillemot at uh, uh, Ubisoft. Uh, he, he was hoping that we would hit 5 billion gamers in 10 years, I guess roughly doubling from where we are now. And he thinks one of the ways we would do that is, is through cloud gaming, uh, making gaming much, you know, AAA gaming in particular, much more affordable across all platforms. I mean, uh, are, are you bullish on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the nice things there is you can truly be device independent. Mm -hmm. So um, you don't need to rely on the, uh, the capabilities of your individual device to do some amazing things. Um, I think latency is still going to be a challenge, mm -hmm. especially for some, some games that require low, low latency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about uh, openness in the game industry? And uh, you know, uh, I think I think Blizzard's impulses seemed uh, uh, more closed over the years. Um, you know, in things like uh, Battle.net or uh, the Auction House example, running running these things yourselves was sort of uh, uh, the best way to ensure a lot mm -hmm. of that quality, right? Uh, but there's a lot of different voices, like say Tim Sweeney now talking about you know we're going to make the metaverse and all that and we need all these open standards uh, to fall into place in order to, to make these great futures for gaming happen. And I wonder you know, what, what you think about some of that and whether um, you know, if, if you looked back on Blizzard, maybe um, Blizzard could have done more on that front. One of the things I think mm -hmm. that's been really important for Blizzard is to maintain the direct uh, relationship with our with our players and so um, having a platform that we owned and controlled um, was was important for that strategy mm -hmm. um, and also not to be dependent on other publishers mm -hmm. um, so if we needed uh, the platform to do um, certain things uh, to support specific games that was within our control mm -hmm. Um, I think that the, the platforms and tools have really improved a lot in the last decade. Um, you know, so it's probably less important for, uh, for studios, especially if they don't have that technology already. Mm -hmm. Did you ultimately, ultimately think of Blizzard as a studio as opposed to something else? I thought of Blizzard as a as a developer and publisher. Mm -hmm. But not, uh, say, more ambitious than those two words mean, I guess? Uh, over uh, what would be more ambitious? I don't know, a platform, I guess, oh. might, might be another buzzword to throw in there. <laughs> um, I thought of Battle.net as a platform. Uh -huh. yeah. We're pretty proud of it. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so what's your prediction for where Blizzard's going to go, you know, looking <laughs> at it from the outside? Well, as a gamer, you know, I hope it continues making excellent games. I look forward to playing them. Mm -hmm. um, I have a ton of friends that are still at the company that I talk to. Mm -hmm. um, Jay is a very good uh, personal friend. So, um, you know, I know they're working on a bunch of things, and, and I just wish them a lot, of, a lot of luck and a lot of success. Mm -hmm. And, and when you think about what you're doing next, you're, you're not announcing any of that, but what, what's your thought process for what you want to do? Well, right now the process is making a, a list of all of the ideas that, that we come up to. Um, uh, my wife, Amy, and I have been uh, talking to a lot of people um, that are doing interesting things, um, going to some conferences and hearing you know, not only what's going on in the games industry, but also what's just what's going on in a, a lot of different industries around the world. And, um, and we have ideas all the time that go onto our list. And then we start, um, we're starting to develop out some of these I ideas mm -hmm. um, and explore them. Mm -hmm. so does that remind you of some of those early days with Alan and, and Frank, I guess? 
You know, um, we were we were very focused on um, always very focused on executing stuff. Um, so I don't know that we had um, the luxury of being in sort of just a completely uh, open, um, unconstrained space. Um, it was, we knew we wanted to make games. Um, I remember we did have some, uh, some brainstorming, brainstorming sessions with the whole company where we would just break off into groups and, and pitch various ideas and very quickly we would f focus, narrow that down and focus on what we wanted to pursue and then boom, we were, we were going. Well, congratulations on what you've done and uh, we're excited to see what you're doing next. Thank you very much, Dean. Mm -hmm. Thank you.